Beware what you ask, no man. Curiosity is a charming trait until it is not. Curiosity. Information will be volunteered, not coerced. It will create more questions than it answers. When at last their shadow is cast upon the firmament, it will take more than you can possess to bind and silence the screams within your mind. Silence. Hi, I'm Chris Wilson from Grinding Gear Games. Thank you so much for joining us today as we unveil Path of Exiles 3.13 expansion. This release contains everything you've come to expect from a Path of Exile expansion release. A new challenge league, new skills, new items, metagame rebalances, and an endgame content update which will leave a lasting impact on Path of Exile. Our team have been very hard at work over the last few months and we've got a lot up our sleeves to share with you today. But before we jump in, we wanted to mention that Twitch drops are enabled for the duration of this live stream. Below the stream, you'll find the instructions to link your Path of Exile account to Twitch so that you're eligible to receive drops. 2020 was certainly a difficult year for development, but it was also one that saw a lot of big things happen with Path of Exile. In late 2019, we held our first ExileCon convention, where we announced several projects, including Path of Exile 2 and Path of Exile Mobile. Throughout 2020, we developed four major expansions. Delirium, Harvest, and Heist, as well as the one we're going to unveil today. We launched on the Epic Games Store and released our Vulcan renderer and a MacOS client for Path of Exile. We're really proud of what we achieved last year under difficult conditions and can't wait to continue the journey with you through 2021, where we expect to reveal much more about Path of Exile 2 and Path of Exile Mobile, as well as four releases for Path of Exile, including the one you're about to see. Thanks again for being here with us. It wouldn't be possible without you. In today's live stream, we'll kick things off with a 3.13 announcement trailer, then take a deep dive into exploring the new expansion's content and features. Once the reveals are wrapped up, we'll launch into a live Q&A where community streamer Ziggy D will ask me questions from Twitch chat, so be sure to get your questions ready. Once the Q&A is over, we'll be jumping into an episode of the Bay Class podcast, where Taki Cat and his crew of Path of Exile veterans will discuss today's reveals. I'm sure you're keen for me to stop talking and start revealing the new content, so let's jump right into the 3.13 trailer. See you on the other side. What drives you, exile? Is it justice? Revenge? Honor. No, it is power. We felt your deeds. Felt their shockwaves ripple through the void. You have our attention. Now you must keep it. Your limits will be tested. Break them. Do what is thought impossible, and the Atlas will follow. That's one of my favorite Path of Exile trailers. We've released, what, like 35 trailers so far over the last decade, and I still get shivers watching each new one. Props to our video guy Eben for great work as usual. So there's a lot to cover based on what we've just seen. Let's get right into it. 
2016, we introduced the Atlas of Worlds, a formal progression system for Path of Exile's endgame maps that culminated in a pinnacle boss fight against the Shaper. Since then, the War for the Atlas and Conquerors of the Atlas expansions have expanded the Atlas system, introduced new endgame bosses, broadened mechanics, added new rewards, and provided more opportunity for mastery of Path of Exile's endgame. The Echoes of the Atlas expansion introduces a new pinnacle boss, a new way to fight many map bosses at the same time, 11 new maps to explore, and new endgame rewards to earn. Just a few map tiers into Echoes of the Atlas, you will begin to encounter an NPC called the Envoy. It seems that when the Elder was sealed, its absence didn't go unnoticed. The Envoy speaks ominously of new visitors to the Atlas. The first such visitor, and the focus of this endgame expansion, is an entity called the Maven. You'll first encounter the Maven in the boss arena of a map, where she will make the boss encounter more difficult and watch as you do your best to defeat it. If you're successful, she'll give you her beacon, which lets you call her to any map in that region, so she can watch more fights. After showing her your boss-killing prowess, she will give you an invitation to her own realm, where she has prepared a special challenge. The Maven really wants to push you to your limits and has fabricated copies of the bosses she watched you defeat. This time, however, you'll have to defeat them simultaneously. If you manage to best her challenge, she'll politely ask you to do the whole cycle again, except this time she wants to watch more and tougher fights, and her next challenge will contain four bosses, then five, then six, and finally ten. If you're persistent and talented, you may even get to fight the Maven herself in a very difficult boss encounter designed to challenge the strongest and best Path of Exile players. Completing the Maven's challenges offers the opportunity to acquire some very powerful new rewards, including Atlas passive skill points, craftable watchstones, and even the Maven's Orb. As you complete the Maven's challenges, you'll earn a new type of passive skill point that can be allocated on a special passive skill tree in that region of the Atlas of Worlds. Each of the Atlas's regions has its own passive tree, and they generally have around 20 nodes to choose from. You can earn up to a total of 10 skill points per Atlas region. Let's check out some of the Atlas passive choices in the Glenic Cairns region. This branch allows you to focus on Beyond, increasing the amount of experience granted by Beyond monsters, but also allowing you to spawn more Beyond monsters really easily. The Torn Veil notable will drastically increase the quantity of Beyond demons you can encounter. The Legion branch has a notable passive which increases the amount of time you have to break enemies out and makes it easier to break them out. It's an example of a skill that you could invest into while you're weak and then remove it later once you're more powerful. And yes, as I implied here, there is an orb that lets you refund Atlas passives. The Incursion branch allows you to more easily get higher tier rooms in the Temple of Atsuatl and helps you make a definitive decision on whether to swap specific rooms. On the Ambush branch, the tamper-proof notable passive upgrades all strongboxes to be rare and corrupted. This synergizes incredibly well with the Ambush Sana mod or prophecies like Monstrous Treasure. While it prevents you from re-rolling valuable types of strongboxes, the sheer number of corrupted 6-socket and 6-link items will certainly be tempting. Now let's have a look at the Atlas passive choices available in the Lex Proxima region. The Harvest Branch can increase your chances of finding a Sacred Grove, increase its crafting rewards, and make it more likely that you'll encounter a Shavi. We'll explain later in the presentation about how Harvest is being integrated into the core game in this expansion. The Torment Branch can increase item drops from possessed and touched monsters, as well as populating the area with some already possessed monsters. These synergize quite well with the Sextants that guarantee a certain amount of rewards from possessed monsters. The Delve branch can increase your Sulfite gains, grant more Master Favor, and grant more Nico Master Missions. The Sulfite Infusion notable passive grants Sulfite for defeating map bosses, regardless of whether the area has Nico present. This means that you'll be constantly gaining Sulfite for every map you do in a region, which is a great strategy if you're not already using Sulfite Scarabs aggressively. There are also Breach passives, which increase your chances of encountering a Breach and ramp up the difficulty and rewards of your Breaches. Naturally, new endgame content means new endgame rewards. Watchstones are an endgame item that can be placed in the Atlas of Worlds to upgrade a region's map tiers and add new base maps to that region. 
There are two types of existing watchstones, quest item ones that can upgrade a region and can't be traded between players, and unique ivory watchstones that provide special bonuses and can be traded. These unique ones are consumed after a number of maps are run. The Echoes of the Atlas expansion introduces three new types of craftable watchstones, titanium, chromium, and platinum. Like regular watchstones, these never expire, but unlike regular watchstones, they can be traded and crafted. They are found quite late in your progression through the Atlas. The eventual goal is that you replace all of your base quest item watchstones with the new craftable ones over time as you upgrade your Atlas. Each of these three types of new watchstone has its own special mod pool, but there's also a shared mod pool that they all draw from. Like flasks, they can only be normal or magic. You can't find or craft rare watchstones. Because you can have up to four watchstones socketed in a region, up to eight mods can affect that region and some quite large bonuses to specific content can be stacked. When combined with the Atlas passive trees, these really allow you to optimize what content you encounter and the rewards from that content. The Maven's Orb is an endgame crafting currency item that can only drop from the Maven herself. It allows you to craft influence modifiers when two or more are present on an item by removing one modifier and upgrading another. When upgrading an influence modifier of the current highest tier, it upgrades to a new elevated tier that can have additional properties. This Foul Regalia has two Crusader influence modifiers on it, the Percentage Increased Intelligence one and the Physical Damage Taken as Lightning Damage one. When we apply a Maven's Orb to it, it randomly removes one of these mods and upgrades the other one to become an elevated influence mod. In this case, it upgraded the Increased Intelligence mod to also have plus one to the level of socketed intelligence gems. The other influence mod is removed. This opens up a mod slot, of course, so it's now possible to add another mod to it. Let's YOLO exalt it for good measure. Maven's Orb crafting is only going to be performed by the upper echelons of elite players, and pushes the boundaries of the best items that are possible in Path of Exile. One of the things that players look forward to in an endgame Path of Exile expansion is new maps to play. In Echoes of the Atlas, we have added 11 new types of maps to the Atlas of Worlds, covering a wide variety of environments. And of course, each comes with its own challenging boss fight. Let's have a look at four of these new tile sets. why these new maps look so good is that the environment art tile set and level design teams working on them have been doing so much work on Path of Exile 2 recently. And it's not just the four maps that we showed you here, there are seven other new maps with our own bosses to discover in-game in this expansion. Whenever we release a new quarterly Path of Exile update, we start a new Challenge League. These are essentially a fresh server to play on for that expansion launch, where players explore the new league mechanics, rush to conquer the new economy, race to level 100, and try to get the best items before their friends. The Challenge League being released alongside Echoes of the Atlas is the Ritual League. In the Ritual League, you'll discover several mysterious altars in each area you explore. Slay the monsters at the Ritual site and then activate the altar to initiate the Ritual. When it begins, you'll be enclosed within the Ritual Circle and will have to face off against both the onslaught of monsters you've just slain and also the specific powers of that altar. Each subsequent ritual in the area will summon all the monsters from the previous ones, so the difficulty and reward ramp up as you challenge yourself with each successive ritual. Monsters you kill after you have activated a ritual grant you points called Tribute. At the end of each ritual, you'll have an opportunity to spend this tribute on various reward items. These items vary greatly in power and cost, so you may find you can afford several cheaper ones or one more valuable one. For clarity, Tribute doesn't transfer between game areas. As you complete subsequent rituals in the same area, more potential rewards will be revealed, which can be very expensive. If you can't afford to purchase a reward outright, you can spend a portion of its cost to defer it until later. This means that it will show up in a later area at a reduced price. Items can be deferred multiple times until you can eventually afford them, and for some of the most valuable rewards in this league, this may be the easiest way to obtain them. 
You can also spend some tribute to re-roll the contents of the reward screen one time per instance if you'd like a new set of reward items to choose from. Among the many other rewards you can choose from in Ritual are a special new set of Ritual base types. These are craftable items that have different implicit modifiers than Path of Exile's regular base types. Specifically, they have a strong upside combined with an accompanying downside. If you can create a build that mitigates this drawback, then you can take advantage of the power of these items and craft them into something amazing. For example, these Nexus gloves reduce your maximum mana but have a chance of immediately refunding the mana spent to use a skill. If you can work around this restriction to your mana pool, you can periodically use skills for essentially no mana cost. Here are two other examples of ritual base types, the Penitent Mask and the Stormrider Boots. The Penitent Mask applies the Crush debuff to you, removing your physical damage protection. However, its upside is that it increases the effect of Fortify on you by quite a lot, reducing the damage you take from hits. There are many situations where this is a huge win, such as if you already have no armor or endurance charges. The Stormrider Boots reduce your accuracy rating but provide a huge added lightning damage boost to your attacks based on your accuracy rating. If you have other sources of accuracy to rely on, then this is potentially a huge increase to the lightning damage you deal. In the end game, you can obtain Ritual Vessels, which allow you to itemize the monsters from a ritual. You can place up to four vessels in the map device alongside a map to add the monsters stored in those vessels to the rituals present in the map. This increases both the difficulty and rewards of the rituals, as well as generating even more tribute to spend on those rewards. For example, because there's a chance of encountering a Headhunter or Mirror of Calandra as rewards, using Ritual Vessels increases the chances you'll be offered those items and allows you to afford them. In addition, you can use these vessels to substantially increase monster density and max out maps that have mechanics like Beyond or Delirium present. Using vessels, you have control over the risk and reward of your hardest Ritual encounters. Vessels are tradable both before and after they contain monsters. In addition to the new endgame content in the Ritual Challenge League, a large focus of the Echoes of the Atlas expansion is on its Ascendancy classes. Path of Exile has 19 Ascendancy classes, which let you specialize your character further than the base character classes allow. To unlock your Ascendancy class, you must find the Altar of Ascendancy at the end of the Lord's Labyrinth. In this expansion, we've rebalanced every one of these 19 classes and have significantly reworked three of them, the Elementalist, the Inquisitor, and the Deadeye. The aim of these changes is to redistribute and simplify power so that Ascendancy passive skills perform stronger single functions more effectively. Let's check some of them out. The Elementalist has always been a good general Ascendancy class for many Elemental builds, but lacked really in-depth build options. Now you can pick which Elemental ailments to use for greater build customization, as well as providing more consistent power against tougher enemies. The Elementalist can also protect themselves from a large amount of Elemental damage. Bastion of Elements provides a significant defensive shield against elemental damage, which can be further improved by allocating more skills on your passive tree and ascendancy tree. The Liege of the Primordial and Elementor skills focus on golem builds. Taking Liege of the Primordial now means that your golems are automatically resummoned four seconds after they die. To make your golems immune to elemental damage, you'll now need to spec into Elementor as well as Liege of the Primordial. Previously, the Shaper of Desolation skill forced you to improve both Shocking and Chilling, even if you didn't use both. We've now moved these benefits into their own branches, culminating in the Shaper of Flames, Winter, and Storm skills, allowing you to pick which ailments you improve. You can use and enhance Ignite, Chill, and Shock on any build. Mastermind of Discord no longer focuses on Heralds and allows you to strip all elemental resistances from your enemies effectively. Pendulum of Destruction has been reworked as Heart of Destruction, providing more elemental damage or area of effect when you need them most. The Inquisitor has derived much of its power from its inevitable judgment skill, but the rest of the tree was fairly straightforward and lacked anything truly unique. After our changes in this expansion, many more of the Inquisitor skills provide significantly more offensive or defensive power, while Instruments of Zeal opens up an entirely new and very unique playstyle. Let's have a look at some of the new Inquisitor Ascendancy skills. Pious Path no longer affects attack and cast speed, and now allows you to double the potential recovery of life regeneration by having it apply equally to Energy Shield. Sanctuary no longer provides mana, but now has a larger damage bonus from Consecrated Ground, up from 10% to 15%. 
Righteous Providence has been simplified a lot. It still focuses on critical strike chance, but it now scales it up by a percentage equivalent to either your strength or intelligence value, whichever one is lowest. It also provides plus 50 to both of these attributes, which is a huge benefit in multiple ways. You will definitely want lots of both attributes. Instruments of Virtue has been simplified and made more powerful. Its benefits no longer strictly apply if you've cast a spell or attacked recently, but it now grants 10% more attack damage for each non-instant spell you've cast recently, up to a maximum of 30%. It also grants Battle Mage, which causes you to gain added spell damage equal to the damage of your main hand weapon. This provides a lot of new hybrid spellcast and melee build possibilities. You can combine Instruments of Virtue with the new Instruments of Zeal Ascendancy passive. This introduces the concept of fanaticism, which causes spells you cast yourself to have 75% more cast speed, reduced mana cost, and increased area of effect. Fanaticism is gained by using attacks regularly, giving huge bonuses for weaving attacking and spellcasting together. Historically, the Deadeye Ascendancy was the best place to find a variety of strong projectile-based effects. But over time, more of these effects have shown up on items, and the Deadeye has lost much of what made it unique. We've brought the uniqueness back to this Ascendancy with a variety of new mechanics that enable new ways to build and play ranges. Let's have a look at the new Deadeye Ascendancy skills. Far Shot now deals 60% more damage to enemies far away from you, which is up from 30% before, but now also deals 20% less damage to enemies that are close. It no longer has a projectile speed bonus, but now removes the spread from your barrages. This additional damage rewards Deadeyes who can keep their distance from their targets. Previously, Ricochet caused your projectiles to chain an additional time and granted 10% more damage for each remaining chain. The new Ricochet allows your projectiles to both chain an additional time and have a chance to chain off walls and terrain. Endless Munitions has been simplified to offer two additional projectiles rather than one additional projectile and some other minor bonuses. This skill is accessible behind three of the Deadeye's paths, making it an option for many different Deadeye builds. Occupying Force is a new skill that benefits Mirage Archers by granting you additional ones and allowing them to be separate from you. Gathering Winds now always grants Tailwind to permanently boost your speed, and the increase to Tailwind effect per skill used is now given by the Gale Force buff. Wind Ward enhances the Gathering Winds passive by making Gale Force a lot more effective, with the drawback of losing all Gale Force if you're hit. If you can stay out of the fray, this potentially makes your character even more potent. The Rupture skill previously helped Critical Strike bleed builds. It's been renamed to Rupturing and has been simplified while being made more powerful. Critical Strikes that inflict bleeding now also inflict Rupture, which causes bleeding enemies to lose more life but their bleed expires more quickly. Focal Point is a new skill which improves the effect of Mark skills that were made more powerful in our recent Heist expansion. It increases the effect of your marks by 75% and makes surrounding enemies deal less damage to you. As you have seen, the Elementalist, Inquisitor, and Deadeye have undergone some major changes in this expansion. We have also improved the other 16 Ascendancy classes and will show you some of the changes to the Slayer to demonstrate what you can expect. Some Slayer effects were much stronger than others, limiting build choice. We've now provided more power spread out over a wider selection of passives, while allowing easier access to the Slayer's special leech mechanic. Brutal Fervor and Endless Hunger have switched places on their Ascendancy branch so that Life Leech is more accessible and can be further improved by specking into Endless Hunger. Masterful Form still causes you to have Endurance Charges equal to the number of Frenzy Charges you have, but now grants an additional Frenzy Charge instead of increasing Endurance and Frenzy Charge duration. Overwhelm's base critical strike chance for attacks with weapons has been increased. Hopefully you now have a good idea of the scope of changes that we have made to the 19 Ascendancy classes. While the biggest changes are to the three we're heavily revamping, the Elementalist, Inquisitor, and Deadeye, all of the others have received at least numeric attention also. We believe that the new design philosophy for Ascendancy passives makes them easier to understand and that they are a more concentrated source of power. We look forward to revealing the rest of the changes next week. Like with improving Ascendancy classes, adding new skill and support gems to Path of Exile helps create new ways to play. In Echoes of the Atlas, we've introduced two new gems that provide versatile ways for you to build powerful new characters. These are the Hydrosphere Skill Gem and the Trinity Support Gem. First, let's have a look at Hydrosphere. The skill summons a huge sphere of water that you can move around to crush enemies. While it is active, you can apply cold or lightning ailments to it. It will then pulse for a duration, afflicting nearby enemies with damage matching that ailment. 
This flare is applying freeze to the hydrosphere with freezing pulse, and that causes it to repeatedly damage surrounding enemies with cold damage. Here's the gem hover for hydrosphere. This skill gem can be acquired from level 34 and can be supported with spell, area of effect, duration, cold, orb, lightning, and physical support gems. It pulses every 0.4 seconds while an ailment is applied to it. It also converts its physical damage to cold or lightning damage based on what ailments are on it. The Trinity support gem is designed to support builds that deal multiple types of elemental damage. While Trinity supports your skill, any hits that deal damage with a specific element will build resonance with the other two elements. The more resonance you have of every element, the more damage the Trinity support gem provides. When you have high resonance with all three elements, Trinity also grants elemental penetration. Here you can see the player using Ball Lightning with Unleash and Magma Orb to build resonance across all three elements. To power up the Trinity support gem quickly and uniformly, the player alternates between pairs of elemental damage types. Combined with the Elemental Weakness Curse, the Maximum Resonance Trinity absolutely decimates enemies. In addition to introducing the two entirely new gems we described, we have done an extensive balance pass on other skills. We have buffed over 40 existing gems, including skills such as Scorching Ray, Seismic Trap, Firestorm, Venom Gyre, Static Strike, Kinetic Bolt, Crackling Lance, Lightning Strike, Shrapnel Ballista, and Artillery Ballista. Full details will be available in the patch notes next week so that you can plan your perfect build. As well as introducing and rebalancing skills, another important aspect of keeping the metagame fresh in a Path of Exile expansion is adding new unique items to discover and build characters around. Unlike most items you find in Path of Exile that are randomly generated, unique items are extremely rare ones that our design team have hand-created to offer new build opportunities. Echoes of the Atlas introduces 10 new unique items, some of which are exclusive to its new endgame encounters. Let's have a look at a few. These are some unique Wormscale boots called Legacy of Fury. They place scorched ground as you travel, which applies the Scorch ailment to enemies standing in it. When scorched enemies die, they have a chance to set fire to surrounding enemies, dealing a percentage of the slain enemy's life over time. These boots create an interesting and new way to support your build with fire damage. This is a new unique amethyst ring called Black Flame, which is themed around fire and chaos damage. Its headline effect is that your ignites now deal chaos damage, along with a cool new chaos ignited effect on monsters. Also, if you ignite a withered enemy while wearing Black Flame, the wither will no longer expire and you can build up to its maximum of 15 stacks, if the enemy survives long enough, that is. Along with its various other benefits, this unique ring should ignite a few new ways of playing fire and chaos damage characters. These new Zealot gloves are called Hand of the Fervent and create an interesting interaction between physical damage and the mana cost of skills. The unique ability of these gloves happens whenever you use a skill. They grant an effect called Sacrificial Zeal, which both adds a quarter of the skill's mana cost to spell physical damage, but also hurts you to the tune of 150% of the skill's mana cost over 4 seconds. They also reduce your enemy's physical damage reduction. When we have time during an expansion's development, we try to identify past leagues that can be integrated into the core game as optional side content, with a few improvements. This expansion contains two such leagues. Last year, we released the Harvest League, which allowed you to grow a garden of monsters, fight them, and then use their lifeblood to craft your items in powerful ways. Watching this league unfold made us realize two things. Firstly, the crafting options were so powerful and so easily accessible that players had unprecedented access to almost everything they wanted very quickly. Secondly, even the players who did enjoy the mechanics of growing their own garden would probably find it boring if that was something they had to do every single league. When deciding how to integrate Harvest into the core game, we knew that we had to curtail crafting somehow, but we didn't want to just do this by nerfing it a lot. We needed a smarter solution that still allowed players to earn and perform powerful crafts. We also knew that we didn't want players to have to grow and manage their own gardens every league. So let's check out how Harvest works as part of the core game in Echoes of the Atlas. In Echoes of the Atlas, as you play through maps, rather than finding a seed cache, you'll now encounter a portal to the Sacred Grove. But it's not your own Sacred Grove, it's an established one that is a full complement of plants ready to harvest, fight, and craft with. The grove contains several pairs of harvests to choose between, each displaying the details of the fight and the corresponding crafting options. You can only pick one of each pair, so carefully choose which crafting options are best for you, defeat the monsters, and use their life force to perform the crafts.
If you're strong enough to kill the monsters, each grove represents quite a lot of crafting opportunities, and you can save up to 10 crafts for later use at the Horda Crafting Station, which is now available in your hideout. We like this compromise because it keeps the exciting elements of harvest, fighting and crafting, and drops the part that got old quickly, seed management and garden planning. We're also integrating the Heist League into the core game as optional content, with a few improvements. In Heist, players travel to the Rogue Harbor to hire a crew of thieves to help them plan and execute risky heists, working towards a thief's ultimate goal, pulling off a grand heist. In the Echoes of the Atlas expansion, heist contracts drop from Act 6 onwards. Rogues level up their skills faster from completing heists, markers drop with higher stack sizes, and quest contracts are now dropped for you at the next Smuggler's Cache as soon as that quest is available. One great aspect of Heist is that all of its progress items are tradable, so if you're focusing on other content, you can trade away your contracts until you're ready to go on some heists. So we've covered most of the big features of Echoes of the Atlas so far. Keep an eye out for the patch notes in a few days where we will detail other changes that didn't make it into this presentation. Soon we'll move on to the Q&A about today's announcements, but first, let's have a quick look at the new supporter packs that are available right now to celebrate the Echoes of the Atlas expansion and the Ritual Challenge League, and to help fund the ongoing development of Path of Exile. The Faithsworn and Renegade supporter packs come with masses of points to spend in the store, social frames, forum titles and badges, a download of the digital soundtrack, and of course exclusive cosmetic microtransactions such as armor sets and character effects. The Renegade series has an exclusive pet, and the Faithsworn series an exclusive portal effect. Each series has two packs, and the smaller packs can be upgraded to their respective larger packs at any time while they are still on sale. These are, of course, in addition to the new core packs that we released a couple of weeks ago. Remember to check those out if you haven't already. Thanks so much for your support. As you know, purchases of these packs are what fund ongoing development of Path of Exile, its expansions, and its sequel. Speaking of Path of Exile 2, we know you're keen for an update. While today is all about Path of Exile and Echoes of the Atlas, we have plenty of Path of Exile 2 and Path of Exile Mobile updates planned for you this year, which will start sooner than you think. Our team have been creating some amazing stuff and we can't wait to reveal it to you. So, I'm sure you have a bunch of burning questions about Echoes of the Atlas. Stay tuned as we're joined by Ziggy D, who will be hosting a Q&A with me based on your questions from Twitch chat.